Welcome back to Fixing My Faith. Today we will be reviewing the 2024 annual meeting of Jehovah's Witnesses. Now this annual meeting happens every year, uh, this time in October, and it's like any big corporation, they have annual meetings. It's kind of a policy, they have to have annual meetings. So it's interesting at these annual meetings, a lot of times we see a glimpse of where the organization is going. They kind of spell it out. And uh, this annual meeting is uh, given to members all over the earth, uh, like circuit overseers, missionaries, and uh, elders, certain ones, not all of them. So it's given to them early, and then it's re later released to the general public. So it's kind of like a little teaser, these elders. I remember when I was uh, in the congregation back in 2012, uh, one particular elder, the service overseer, he had privy, he had, he was privy to the annual meetings somehow. And he would come back and I remember we'd be out in service and he would talk, he would throw out all these little teasers as to what's coming. As if he was um, uh, some guy with lots of knowledge. So we'd look at him as some guy with lots of knowledge. That's, that's what happens in the organization. So, so it's kind of a privilege if you have seen uh, the annual meeting um, as a Jehovah's Witness. But as a non-Jehovah's Witness, when we look at a lot of this stuff, it triggers us. It, uh, we, we listen to these speakers lie through their teeth and how they can just get up and they know all about all the problems that they're causing all over the earth with, with ex-members, with uh, the blood doctrine, all the people that are dying. They have to go to court all over the earth to, tr to fight tooth and nail for a doctrine that kills you. You see, Jesus was about love, about life, uh, uh, Jehovah's Witnesses are about death, about judgment. <clears throat> you gotta, you got to be judged until you die. You go to jail. It's, it's a very uh, harsh way of looking at it. But that's how the religion is run. So what we see at the annual meeting this year is uh, some highlights. I have the thumbnail up there, so uh, uh, I'm going to go over uh, Miss Usado's uh, information on Avoid JW, and I'll put a link to it in my description of this video. But what I got out of the uh, out of the annual meeting was uh, the young. It's all about the young people. This is indoctrination towards the young, and you're going to see it as we read through it. And we'll we'll have some PDFs to look at. Now this will be revised coming up on the 15th, but I thought let's, let's get the read through before we see the revision. It's a really good read, and so uh, let's, let's get after it. Okay, so here we are, uh, the 2024 annual meeting. Now this is off of Void JW again. This is where uh, Miss Usato has posted her article. So we're going to read this uh, in October 2024. The annual meeting occurred in Newburgh, California on October 5th, beginning at 8.45 a.m. Eastern Time. As is tradition, the meeting opened with a musical prelude featuring a montage of children being baptized. Isn't that something, eh? So again, we're, we're seeing how they're focusing on the children. So the aerial footage of the global disasters, they always like to show that, to show, you know, that uh, all these things are happening and that they're in there and they're doing all their big work, right? And then there's scenes of natural beauty. So, of course, they want to take the audience to the paradise pictures. So the, it concluded with an AI-generated clip depicting a child peacefully sleeping beneath a panther in a vision of paradise. And here you can read a general outline of how the day went. The annual meeting will also be broken down into PDFs by talk and uploaded here by October 14th. So there's more coming on this. Uh, well, actually, it's to, it is the 14th today. So, Okay, so the governing body member, Gage Flegel, was the chairman for the annual meeting and featured on introduction video of children doing their baptismal questions. So you see the two pictures up there. Now, the introduction to the annual meeting, Gage Flegel, a governing body member, opened the annual meeting with a series of beard jokes. Isn't that something, you know, that all these beard jokes are all coming out? Now that the facial hair is allowed and is not a matter of disapproval, beard jokes were laced throughout the meeting. It's kind of a shame. 
You know, uh, last year you could be reprimanded for wearing a beard, but this year you're a hero. Look at the governing body. Like it's such a farce, you know, when you look at this stuff. But anyways, uh, these guys are making big jokes about it. And under the new policy, which allowed more a more lenient approach to those previously shunned, he reminded attendees that we welcome back thousands who have been removed from the congregation. Thousands. So how many is thousands? Well, I went to Google and they say uh, to us a few thousand could be 2,000, 3,000, 4,000. Probably three or 4,000 rather than just 2,000. So thousands. And I went down and and that's what they're saying. It's not it's not a big number, thousands. So when you think of this, um, there's a... Let's pull the calculator where you can see it. There's about 120,000 congregations, right? So if you have thousands coming back, thousands, so let's let's give them the high number. Let's give them the 4,000. So we'll divide that by 4,000. 4,000. That means one in every 30 congregations, one person comes back. In 30 congregations, one person comes back. So he makes it sound like we welcome back thousands who have been removed from the congregation. So basically one one person in 30 congregations comes back to this organization. That's very few. Very few people have come back, but they try to make it sound big. So Flegel then emphasizes the historical importance <clears throat> of October, highlighting two key events. The first was October 539 BCE, the date of Belshazzar's feast, known for the famous writing on the wall, Mini, Mini, Tekel, Parson in the biblical story of Daniel. And his second point was the October 1924 literature Ecclesiastes indicated, which described how this wicked system blinds people to truth with clergy, churches pledging their allegiance to the devil. When I, uh, when I think of that point, um, meanie, meanie, tekel, parson in the Bible, you know, they throw this out but boy, do they have to be careful because everything they throw out is coming back to them. So to me, it's like the handwriting is on the wall, like they're throwing this out there, but the handwriting is on the wall for this organization. Its days are numbered. That's what that means. But yet they, they like to point at other people. This is what narcissists do. Uh, they take the attention off themselves and they point their fingers elsewhere. So uh, if you notice in the, um, in the article here, it brains out, uh, that's, that's what they did. They, um, right at the end here, uh, his second point was the October 24 literature, which indicated, uh, how this wicked system blinds people to the truth. So, so you see this message is that everyone's blinded out there. You know, it's a wicked world. Only the Jehovah's Witnesses have the truth. And then it goes on to sum this up with the clergy and the churches pledging their allegiance to the devil. What a slam against uh, all your neighbors out there. All your neighbors out there that are helping in all the disasters. Uh, these are the clergy, the churches that are helping um, Jehovah's Witnesses perhaps down in North Carolina in these disaster areas. A lot of times it's the churches that are out there with their charity helping. So... It's amazing that Jehovah's Witnesses continue to slam the churches and call them the devil. You see, that's what a narcissist does. It takes the devil off themselves because they're hiding pedophiles and they're not apologizing for it. So it takes the devilness off themselves because they point fingers at, uh, at the other churches. So it's interesting how that can work. Okay, we're going to move forward. Uh, the next one is our privilege to glorify Jehovah, Jarrett Loesch. And before Jarrett Loesch hit the podium, it was announced that he had been a member of the governing body for 30 years. Nice little bragging statement. He begins with this talk by holding up a mirror, asking, have you looked into the mirror today? You know, and they really pull this scripture out of context because when you look at the scripture in 2 Corinthians, Paul's talking about how we don't see things clearly because it's a metal mirror. It doesn't reflect a clear message and we'll see the the clear message when Jesus comes back. That's what that scripture really talks about but it's amazing how JW org takes this stuff and just 
gives a little twist on it and makes it their own. And that's what they've done with so many scriptures in the Bible. And if they can't make it their own, they just delete the scripture. And we've seen that in so many cases. So let's carry on. Uh, he says, have you looked in the mirror, bringing up the scripture of 2 Corinthians 3 and 18? And all of us, while with unveiled faces reflect like mirrors the glory of Jehovah, were transformed into the same image from one degree of glory to another, exactly as it's done by Jehovah's Spirit. He created the hazy outline of the metal mirror, and how Paul showed Christians reflect like mirrors in the glory of Jehovah. He lists five types of glory in the Bible. And you see, I couldn't, I, I looked through those scriptures. I couldn't, I couldn't make the parallel. But anyways, here's what he said is he wanted to bring out glory is what I seen when I looked at this talk. And he wanted to bring out and, and get the audience to look at the new governing body members as glorious. So these guys want to wear their crowns before they die. And uh, I think there's a problem with that. Anyways, uh, here's the five points. He says, number one, Jehovah has the highest degree of glory. Number two, the glory of Jesus. And number three, the anointed Christians. You see, here we are. You can't take away Jesus and Jehovah's glory, of course, but let's get the anointed Christians in there. And we're going to go on to see how these anointed Christians are getting younger. And there's more of them. They have a problem with their 144,000 doctrine. You see, that's been filled long ago. They know it. So they got a problem. they got to change their doctrine. And here's how they do it. They do it sleight of hand. This is a magician's trick, sleight of hand. They feed you little bits through all these talks, and pretty soon you say, oh, yeah, yeah, young people. Uh, yeah, the numbers, you know, it's going to all change, folks, that number, that 144,000 and this remnant on earth. It's going to open up to everyone. They're going to look at this 144 as figurative, and next thing you know, everyone's going to be taking the emblems. That's what's going to happen, I think. But anyways, here's what they're doing. Uh, here's how they're pitching it. Anointed Christians on earth and in heaven have a measure of glory and will receive everlasting glory. So, there's a lot of glory, man, if you're anointed. Next time those emblems pass, you might want to think about drinking them and eating them. You know, at the memorial, because there's glory. And young people are doing it. So it's uh, if you're a young person, you're out there and you feel like you want to drink that wine and eat that biscuit or that bread, go for it. Now, number four, elders should be glorified. You see, all the way through, this is nothing new. They want the glory going to the elders. They're, they're in the right hand of Jesus, and uh, they've been pushing this forever. But let's bring it up again. Glorify those elders. You know, because they're reading our elders book, right? You see, the governing body makes the elders book. The elders follow it religiously, and they're judicial about it. So, you want to glorify them. And uh, uh, then it goes on to say, it is mentioned that we should be submissive to these glorified ones. You see, they want you submissive to the elders. They're glorified. And the anointed. Could you imagine 21-year-old anointed in your congregation? And uh, he's a circuit overseer, of course, 21 years old. And you got to give that kid glory. Man, you got to give him a lot of glory. Snotty-nosed little smart-ass brat gets up there. Because that's what happens. 21-year-olds think they know it all. And uh, these guys are going to monopolize on these 21-year-old know-it-alls and give them the elders' book. They'll learn it, and they will know it all. They will be glorified. Number five, the glory in the preaching work. So if you're out in the preaching work, you are glorified. You see, now they made it so that you just check the box. You don't really have to go in the preaching work anymore. That's what they did last year. And this year, they got a few problems. No one's going out in service. So we got to make them glorified. Glorify the ones in the ministry. Yep, they have an extra measure of glory than perhaps you do if you're not out there regularly. Okay, well, let's go on. Uh, it was then that Loesch announced the news of the two new governing body members. I ran that on my live the other night. I'm not going to, like I said, we're not going to play any videos here. We could play it, but we're not playing it. Now, the breaking news was announced on their website where they said that we're pleased to inform you that the annual meeting, uh, uh, blah, 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 Bible Tract Society of Pennsylvania, Brother Garrett Loesch announced that two additional brothers have been appointed to serve as members of the governing body. Brother Jody Jadell and Jacob Rump. Rump? 
Both brothers are anointed Christians. You see that anointed ones, guys? Everyone's got to be anointed. You want to you get to the top, take the emblems. It's going to move you up there fast and go out and service a bit. So both brothers are anointed who have a long history of loyal service to Jehovah. Brother Jadel began his full-time service in 1989 and Bethel service in 1990. And Brother Rump began his full-time service in 1995 and Bethel service in 2020. And both brothers served as helpers to the service committee and the governing body. And we thank our Heavenly Father Jehovah for raising up such faithful men to share in the work of the governing body. We pray that Jehovah will richly bless, bless brothers Jadel and Rump in their, and their wives. Now, we're going to talk about these, these two guys. We're, first of all, going to talk about Jody Jadel, the new governing body member, Jacob Rump and his wife. So there's two of them, Jacob Rump and his wife and Jody Jadel. Now, first of all, let's talk about Jacob Rump. Rumpity bump. Okay, so Jacob Rump, before his appointment to the governing body, Rump was a desk man in the Jehovah's Witness Service Department in Wallkill, New York. Service Department desk men <clears throat> oversee internal judicial committee proceedings across congregations within the United States branch territory, including the handling of sensitive matters such as child molestation cases in local congregations. According to the public exhibits attached to a Montana civil lawsuit against the witnesses, Rump's oversight as a desk man included Mississippi, Montana, Nevada, and North and South Dakota jurisdictions. I did not know that. So here this guy Rump that they brought in, he was the guy overseeing the whole Montana case, which we covered on this channel. Now, a former Jehovah's Witness said that Rump was in his congregation in California as he grew up and eventually became an elder before he went to Bethel. And he was noted as a down-to-earth, very well-known brother. Rump sounds like he is as loyal to the organization as they come, especially if CSA reports arrived at his desk and their departments hide the truth. So here's a perfect guy for the governing body, a guy that knows theocratic warfare. He knows how to hide the truth in court, you see. Even though uh, lying is one of the most detestable things to Jehovah, one of the seven most detestable things to Jehovah, this organization continues to hide behind the term theocratic warfare, which allows them to lie in court. And we've seen it in Montana. So now, Jody Jadel, uh, more of a company man, uh, Jadel started living in Bethel in 1990. He is known for being in the real estate business from 2010 to 2013. And he has been in the service department for over two years. His featured photo above was from a talk on JW Org, Remember the Builder. And he and his wife, Damaris, owned a realty company called Terra Bella Realty in Charlotte, North Carolina. And in 2012, a video was posted from Touchstone International Properties. And the video is here. I'm going to put a link. I'm not going to get into it. But there is a little video, and we've seen it on a lot of the other uh, apostate creators have put this out. So it's out there. This guy, big time into real estate. And I think, uh, was it Blue Envelope that did, did a take on this? Yeah. And uh, he did a nice coverage on it. So now showing Jadel's explaining what a CCIM is, representing as a managing partner, Jodell is also a treasurer and a secretary of the Dayton Beach Assembly Hall and the West Palm Beach Convention Center in Florida. Now, when we were looking at some of this stuff about Jody Jadell, uh, some people were asking questions like, what, what about his vow of poverty? You know, if he, he, if he was up to his neck in money and real estate, how did he transition into Bethel and become a governing body when they all have to take a vow of poverty? Now, I thought about that, and that's an easy one. All you have to do, if you personally want to take a vow of poverty, you can. 
you sink everything into your company. The company is like an individual. It does all the, it, it takes care of all the taxes, everything it has to do. It operates. It owns everything. You don't own anything. You, you've taken a vow of property, poverty, but the company owns it all. And you can hide behind a company in a number of different ways. So uh, it's probably what he does. Uh, there's no way he walked away from all his money. It's uh, He probably has a nice little ATM card that he has in his wallet, uh, separate from the Bethel money that he gets, because that's just token money. But he has his own little ATM card that he can buy whatever he wants, and uh, he can live the high life of a governing body member. Now that's what I think, but... Uh, Tell me what you think in the comments. Okay, well, let's get back to the article. The next uh, story here, uh, and they're all stories, really, folks. This is just an annual meeting telling the whole world, all the shareholders in Jehovah's Witnesses, a bunch of stories. Now, here's this next story. Opportunities to glorify Jehovah in Bethel in theocratic construction. Jeffrey Winder. Winder announced that since the preaching work is now more urgent than ever, they are reducing the minimum age requirement to 18 to apply for Bethel and headquarters in New York. Young brothers and sisters, 21 or older, can now apply to attend the schools for Christian evangelizers, and the adjustment is effective immediately. They need the young people. And now, you see, in some states, uh, some countries and some jurisdictions, you're not legally uh, an adult until you're either 19 or 21, actually, in some states and some countries. So if you can imagine that, they're taking young boys now, 18. They're taking them away from their families, and they're indoctrinating these young boys. You see, these are the young boys now, the 18-year-olds, that have already been indoctrinated by all those movies, all those cartoon movies. They've already been raised with that stuff. And now they're little robots, they're little machines at uh, 18. And they're going to take advantage of it because they've already indoctrinated them. So Winder announced that since the, the preaching work is more urgent than ever now, well, why did they loosen up on it last year? Well, I think what's happened, uh, no one's going out in service. Now it's urgent. We, we've got to get people back in service. So let's just make it urgent. So there's that story. Um, there's a picture of him. Jeffrey Winder glorifying Jehovah again. Bethel in construction. Get the young people involved. The next is Sanderson. Look at look at his beard, eh? All these guys in their beards. Well, Winder didn't grow one. He'd look better with a beard, Winder, and get rid of his pointy little chin. But uh, Sanderson, he's going to have a beard. He likes beards. Sanderson continued to pressure young people to volunteer their lives to the preaching work. Volunteer your life. He takes us back 140 years to 1884 when Zion's Watchtower and Bible Tract Society were legally incorporated and a video that expressed the need for missionaries and a rapid growth from 1943 to 1953 was played. You know, play the old stuff because the old stuff worked back then. Let's just play it again and see if it works again. Now, he mentions that 36 new missionaries were sent to Madagascar and 10 to Lat Latvia, Latvia this past year. And another video interviews some missionaries, and then he announces that those 21 years or older can apply to the School of Kingdom Evangelizers. So the work is still ongoing, and let's keep polishing those miners. We need young people who want to go and make disciples of all the nations. So that's what's going on. They, uh, they announced that 21 years or older can apply now. You, you, you can be young and go to these, uh, become a full-time kingdom evangelizer. Wow. So let's see what else happens. What's next? Well, don't be surprised by the sudden changes. Jeffrey Jackson, Jackson, Jackson shouting through half of his talk. He highlights the changes they have made in the past and adds two more. First, he says, regarding the number of anointed ones, he says, for a long time, we thought that number of anointed ones on earth would slowly decrease over time. And Jackson points out that the number of partakers has recently increased since even younger brothers were appointed to the governing body. 
And he highlights that we need to be careful not to assume that the number of anointed ones will shrink to just a small group of older ones. You see, he's getting everyone prepared to change their doctrine. This is, this is my supposition. They're going to uh, have to come up and say 144,000 is figurative. It's a figurative number. Because we all know that number has been filled long ago. Now, <clears throat> next, Jackson brings up the, the start of the Great Tribulation, emphasizing the importance of recognizing what Revelation 16 tells us. In their eyes now, it speaks of the gradual drying up of the symbolic waters, representing the loss of support for false religion. See, again, the narcissist looking out, getting you not to look at their decreasing numbers. He wants you to look at false religion's decreasing numbers, right? So uh, what does he say? Uh, while this is happening more noticeably in regions like Europe, where there's, there's religion's influence has waned, it's not the same everywhere. In places like Africa, South America, religion remains strong. And he thinks that Revelation 17 and 17 assures us that Jehovah will put the thought into the hearts of the nations to carry out his will and that we must remain alert. So, um, you know, they still don't use Romans 13 and 1 where we're supposed to be subjection to the governments. They never, ever go there. But uh, they dance around it. <clears throat> okay, well, <clears throat> if Jehovah's putting his thoughts into the nations to carry out his wills, that means he's putting, he's working through the governments, just like it says in Romans. And they might as well just come out and say it. You know, we have to be submissive to the governments in lands where, where there's military demands on our people. You, you have to work with those countries. We don't want you in jail. You're just going to have to work with it. You, you can still say you don't want to be in the killing field. You can take non-battle duties, like working in a hospital. Everyone could use a little training there, um, stocking shelves, so forth. So there is different things that <clears throat> different religious people take when it comes to military service. Now, I realize it's different all over the world, and uh, we do get lots of comments on that on the channel. One guy said he just got out of, uh, he was a Jehovah's Witness, served uh, something like, I don't know, so many months uh, in prison because he refused military service and gave his story. It's an interesting topic. Now, uh, Gage Flegel comes on, and uh, we all look at him and his beard and his color coordination. Um, yeah. <laughs> he says, uh, this is uh, Blessings of Jehovah's Mercy. Now, after a short break, a video was played with Sanderson's March 2024 governing body updates announcing how Jehovah has lovingly provided a change in how, uh, in how to treat removed or ostracized, disfellowshipped, shunned members of the congregation. So um, now they're going to get into the, the, the shunning. Now this was a moment, momentous moment for Jehovah's Witnesses whom those excommunicated were treated like the plague. Now the video shows interviews of elders describing what it was like to remove such a wrongdoer and how emotional it was to see them come back, since you know they lost all their family and friends. Now this, the nerve of this organization to go from complete shunning of a removed person to now be an emotional about how wonderful Jehovah is for them to say hello is shocking. And I agree with what Miss Usado is saying here. The nerve of this organization, you know, the, the complete shunning, like even the beard thing, you know, if you were growing a beard a year ago, a year and a half ago, you'd be in the little room with the elders getting disciplined. And then a year later, they're bragging about, you know, they're all making fun of their beards. This shows how this organization works it's just it works on on emotion it's it's not working on logic so they go to complete shunning uh and now uh how wonderful it is you can say hello <laughs> you can't talk to them after the meeting but you can say hello at the meeting if they come back you see most people aren't coming back and that's why they're only saying a uh, one out of 30 congregations one person in every 30 congregations has come back that's it a very very small only thousands have come back in this big organization when there's millions that have left 
Now, hope to tear down and build up Kenneth Cook. Cook's talk uh, conveniently emphasizes the importance of supporting, supporting repentant wrongdoers and highlighting Jehovah's unchanging nature. Um, the importance of supporting repentant wrongdoers. Okay, well, he states Jehovah is the same as yesterday, as today, and forever. And what Jesus did on earth reflects his thinking now, really. And we should strive to imitate him. Jehovah desires people to return to him. Elders are encouraged to seek even the most minor signs of repentance. <laughs> and has, Jehovah, has Jehovah's perspective changed? What should we tear down and what should we build up? Both actions are scripturally justified when appropriate. Jehovah balances his righteousness and mercy. And Cook explains that just as an ice cream sundae requires all of its toppings to be complete, Jehovah's actions, whether tearing down or building up, are defined by how a combination of these qualities works together. So folks, if you ever wonder about yourself, just check out an ice cream sundae. Okay, well, he concludes by noting the governing body's role in dealing with wrongdoers, including those who may lose families, friends, or even their lives, like tearing down buildings, and noted that some are beyond repair, and notably in ruins, like my old body. I'm done. <laughs> can't, you can't rebuild some people, he's saying. So, well, some you can fix. The elders will continue to remove unrepentant ones from the congregation. Of course, there should be ones to send out of the congregation. There should be ones to send out of the congregations. So here it is. Uh, the elders will continue to remove unrepentant ones. And that's what we've seen, folks, in the elders book. We've been covering the elders book um, chapter by chapter. And it's all in there, how to remove people. There's a lot of uh, pages in that book on judicial matters. There's only, it only mentions the word love five times, but it mentions uh, judicial 337 times. So it's a, it's a judicial organization still. Nothing's changed. This is a sad part of this organization. It's not going to change. So becoming Jehovah's friend, now they're going to build some cartoons and we're going to get into how they're indoctrinating the young people. Okay, well, before we get into this next part, um, this next, next part gets really dicey. And this is where the org is really focusing on in the indoctrination of young people. And this is how we're going to conclude. But before we do that, let's put some positive uh, reaffirmations in our mind. Um, here's a cup fixing my faith. You can get that right on our store, our YouTube store. And if you turn it around, it uh, says live your life with love. It's a stainless steel cup. You see it's just smoking, steaming. I just poured a coffee, had a sip. You can also get these shirts in the store below. My good wife does all of that. And if there's any kind of a message you would like in the store on a shirt, uh, just contact my good wife by email and uh, she'll, she'll put it on a shirt for you. Uh, because what you might like, a lot of other people might like it too. Maybe it's a message. Let us know in the comments. Thanks again. So we're going to get back into the, uh, into the uh, <laughs> annual meeting. And here's where it gets dicey. They've been using uh, this stuff, these cartoons, these animated things, um, for quite a while. And it's working. And now they're getting these young people that want to be anointed. So... Becoming Jehovah's Friend, The Greatest Act of Love. It's a new video. This is a new animated episode of Becoming Jehovah's Friend. And at the beginning of the meeting, meeting, meeting the beginning of this meeting, uh, a trailer of the episode was played saying, Coming soon. And then it was announced that they would watch the episode at the annual meeting. Now, it's about a Jehovah's Witness girl, Sof Sophia, who invites her non-believing friend, Zoe, to the memorial. And she studies with the girl, going into the story of Ruth. And eventually, after her mom is pressured to attend the memorial with her, 
this non-believer starts imagining life in a paradise herself. And she sees everyone uniting with their resurrected loved ones. And in the end, before she loses hope of finding her grandmother there, a heavenly Jesus shows up in the clouds and says, Zoe, turn around. And when she does, she sees her grandma walking towards her. So imagine this, um, y a young person, you know, young people watching this stuff. They believe it. This, these are young school, this Sophia. This is a, a series of movies they've been running on JW.org. This is just another animated movie they're adding to their series to indoctrinate young people. Okay, so let's move forward. And they're getting the young people to, to do this at school. So if you uh, have children in school and they're being indoctrinated by Jehovah's Witnesses, be careful. Be careful. Now, let's move on. Everlasting life possible. Boring. Stephen Lett. The most animated governing body member, Lett, comes on stage to talk about how we would never be bored in paradise. And he talks about the brain's capacity, fleas, instruments, and, of course, beards <laughs> beards now we would all become carbon copies of each other uh, with he said would we all become carbon copies of each other with no variety in paradise and he deems that to be shallow reasoning and just because we would be perfect does not mean everyone would have the same in, uh, intense interest and he th then lists some hobbies that we can all do that would make us different. And Lett brings up a photo of two twin boys and how they are not per precisely alike. And his reasoning being that is why we would never be the same. Uh, good job, Lett. Now, wouldn't we learn everything there is to know? Would life become unstimulated? Nothing is boring about Jehovah's creation. And Lett concludes by discussing how many endless things you can learn and experience. Such things, he said, as an example were hairstyles, how you can switch houses with others, and things you can study, like fleas. So there you go. That's, that's how Lett uh, <laughs> is going to tell the audience. Uh, paradise is not going to be boring. Um... Yeah, it could be quite comical if you had to watch Let for a thousand years. That'd be quite quite comical, maybe. Um, yeah, beards, eh? You know, they're so excited about their beards. You could have a pair, uh, a whole thousand years to grow long beards, maybe. <laughs> I don't know. You know, these uh, these guys come up with these talks, right? Um, you can switch houses with others. You know, all these worldly people, they're going to have, um, they're going to be killed, right, at Armageddon. So you can walk into a million-dollar house today. Yeah, maybe I want a $5 million house. Maybe I want a yacht. You know, people can start, uh, you see, these kinds of talks get people thinking like that, how you can switch houses with others. Uh, I, I want to live in a movie star's house, you know, maybe. Oh, uh, there's a lineup. All uh, brothers and sisters in California get that get those houses they get first pick uh there's a line up there anyways how are they going to do it interesting so the next talk is give jehovah glory david splain of course uh this is we know where this is ending up the governing body they're narcissists they want glory they want to wear a crown so let's hear what david splain has to say david splain give glory give jehovah glory splain had the final talk for the meeting and he starts by replying to Flegel leaving the stage, saying there was a special treat in store. And just to be clear, I am not the special treat, we know. His talk was generally a recap of what is glorified in Jehovah's eyes, repeating key points of the previous talks. And he continued, in 2025, we need to preach about God's name more. Sounds like they're having an issue. <laughs> People aren't preaching enough. And he says, let's seriously consider ways to give God glory. Psalms 96 and 8 would be the year's text. And that says, give Jehovah the glory due his name. And Splain reads a poem called, Give Jehovah Glory, which is part of a new original song 
that was then played at the annual meeting. So it sounds like they um, went from Jesus this year to now they're going to go to Je back to Jehovah and worship Jehovah. So let's see how that rolls. Okay, uh, who is like you, uh, O Jehovah High, on your heavenly throne? This is the new song. How could I ever repay you for all the, the love you have shown? And when I look up to heaven, power and glory, I see who they, who they am, I, O Jehovah, that you would show favor to me. My life is yours, O Jehovah. May all I do is bring you praise. So that this all means uh, uh, Watchtower. If, you, if you're praising Jehovah, you're praising the Watchtower. This is all about indoctrination, these songs. They get them singing them. And when they sing them, they uh, put that into their brains. And then they act out on the song. That's how people work. That's how programming works. So that's why we're not uh, playing any songs today. We're not uh, listening to any of the Watchtower propaganda. But we're just reviewing it with Miss through Miss Usado's eyes. So we want to again thank Miss Usado for this wonderful article that she put together. Um, really highlighting what this annual meeting is about. So they go on to say serving you. You know, they want everyone serving the Watchtower, right? Great God, Jehovah. So if you replace the word Jehovah with Watchtower, then these songs all make sense. So let's, let's just talk about it. Serving you, great God, Watchtower, fills me with honor and pride. You are my stretch and my glory forever. You may be my guide. You see, this is all about the Watchtower. Oceans and valleys below me, sun and moon and glory and stars above, fill me with joy and wonder and show me your unending love, Watchtower. Majesty, wisdom, and beauty, these are the things that I see, Watchtower. How could I not give you, Watchtower, glory for making it all come to be? How could I not give you glory, Watchtower, for making it all come to be? You see, that's really what you're putting into your minds. I threw the Watchtower thing in. Okay, so the meeting ended by singing the new song, Give, glory, give Jehovah Glory, with attendance including JW Stream, Canada 708. Newburgh, 2,523, U.S. Bethel, 12,080, and J.W. Stream, 167 countries, 143,070, altogether 159,081 people attended the stream. So some of the announcements and reminders for October 24 for all elders assisting young ones. And notice, folks, this is all about the young people, the changes, and how they're going to uh, uh, exonerate these young people. Let's just, just look in and see what it says. So for elders assisting young ones to reach out for privilege of service, I'll see if I can blow this up a bit. Um, there's a great need. Let me see, I'll blow that back down. There. Okay, so... There's a great need for the young ones to serve at Bethel and large-scale construction projects and to apply to attend the School for Kingdom Evangelizers. Your support of the adjusted age requirement can make a significant difference. And this is a message to the elders in helping young ones reach out for the privilege of service. Please encourage all young ones and their parents in your congregation to consider the importance of establishing spiritual goals while young, while young, and also be alert to identify young ones who have the potential to serve at Bethel or on a large-scale construction project or apply to attend the School for Kingdom Evangelizers. And when such ones qualify, encourage them to submit the appropriate application. So what this tells me is the elders are going to be looking around the congregation for all these young ones and they're going to try to get them into Bethel. And they're going to talk to the parents because the young ones might not be of legal age. So they have to get the parents on board if you're going to get an 18-year-old going, going away from his parents uh, in a country where, uh, let's say, the age 21 is a legal age for an adult. So it says, For the coordinator of body of elders announcing for the congregation, please ensure that the announcements are read at the next midweek meeting. And for the congregation, this looks like what they'll read. Uh, number one, the age requirement to assist with the work at Bethel or on large-scale 
theocratic construction projects. It says, we are thrilled to share an exciting adjustment that was announced at the recent annual meeting. The minimum age to assist with work at Bethel or on large-scale construction projects has, be lo has been lowered from 19 to 18 years of age. So that's why they got to get the parents on board. If, if it's 19 is your legal age to, to, let's say, go into a liquor store or something like that, that's the legal age, then you have to have your parents on board if you're 18 and you're going to go do this. They'd probably have to sign, sign some kind of a paper waiver. So this adjustment opens up new opportunities for young brothers and sisters to serve Jehovah in these vital capacities. Assisting with the work at Bethel number two or on large scale construction projects can be a spiritually enriching experience. It allows young ones to contribute to Jehovah's organization in a unique way and can help them grow in faith and develop valuable skills. We encourage all young brothers and sisters to consider prayerfully whether your circumstances allow you to serve in these capacities. If you live at home with your Christian parents, we encourage you to uh, speak to them about your goals. And after doing so, if you are able to pursue Bethel service or assist with large-scale construction projects on a part-time or full-time basis, please speak to your congregation secretary to receive further instructions on submitting application. <clears throat> you see, your parents at 18 might want you to go and learn how to live on your own, pay rent, get a job, and learn the real skills of life. Your parents might want you to do that. But here now we have this congregation letter, the governing body telling the parents, putting the parents in their place and telling them, parents, mind your own business. If your kid wants to be lazy, doesn't want to learn all this stuff, just wants to be lazy and be looked after by Bethel, you should support that. You should support that. You see, a lot of, a lot of kids at 18, they, they really are afraid. They're afraid to go out and make it in the real world. So this is, this is kind of an escape for them. Let's go to Bethel. It's easy. The, you know, you just, it's like being at home. Mom does all the laundry. Mom does all the cooking. Mom does all the dishes. It's like going to Bethel. And, and sure, you might have to go and do work in laundry for a bit and work your way up, but ah, it's a lot of fun in Bethel. You see, this is how they're going to talk about it. And kids are going to, kids are going to want to do this. I can see a lot of, a lot of kids want to do this. So to serve on a part-time basis, it says, uh, please submit your application. Uh, please submit to become a member of the worldwide order of special, what, they call it a worldwide order now? That sounds almost, cult, that sounds really cultish. An application to become a member of the worldwide order of special full-time servants of Jehovah's Witnesses. Wow, the world order. I work for the world order. Are you going, you know, let's say you're 18. Are you going to the world? I'm working for the world order. It ties in with their new world order. Their new world order. Yeah, it ties all in. Their new world order. I think we're going to see a brand new world order coming out. <laughs> okay, well, we look forward to seeing how Jehovah will bless this exciting adjustment in the age requirement. And number three, the age requirement to attend the School for Kingdom Evangelizers. Another exciting announcement was made at the annual meeting. The minimum age required to attend the School for Kingdom Evangelizers has been lowered from the age 23 to 21 years of age. Imagine that. So if, you, if you're pioneering, let's say you're 18, 17, whatever, you're just in high school, you just finished high school, you start pioneering, you're 18, you, you could go to Bethel, start doing that stuff for a few years, and then by the time you're 21, you're at Bethel doing some stuff, you can now apply for this Kingdom Evangelizers work. And this two-month school is designed to train pioneers who are willing to serve wherever they are needed. And many who attend this school now serve as special pioneers, field missionaries, or circuit overseers. And this is what blew me away, folks, a 21-year-old circuit overseer. Could you imagine? Never ever raised a family, never had kids, never was married. But yet, he's a circuit overseer. He's coming in, and everyone listens to the circuit overseer because the circuit overseer is inspired by Jehovah or the watchtower? It's the watchtower. 
they, they, they like to believe they're inspired by Jehovah, but Jehovah's the watchtower. They're inspired by the elders book and they go to, they go into these congregations, the circuit overseers, and they enforce the elders book is what really happens. So they say this is another exciting opportunity for young brothers and sisters who wish to do more in Jehovah's service. So there you have it. There's the annual meeting. There's the changes. Um, 21 year old circuit overseer. I'm going to be telling you how to have sex with your wife. Imagine that. But he's going to be flipping to the book, phoning people, checking in. Uh, you should only do it missionary style, I think. I, I've never done it before, but 21 year old circuit overseer. Okay, here's my thoughts on it, and I'm not going to get into it. When was Jesus baptized? And when did Jesus start his full-time ministry? It was all around 30 years of age. And when you're 30 years of age, you have a little bit of experience. You're not a, a child that's going to get this fellowship because you haven't even got your ears wet and you're a circuit always here at 21. Haven't even had sex. Imagine that. Did Jesus have sex at 30? Well, that's dispute. That's debatable. There's, there's discussions on that. Anyways, that's not what this was about. This was about the annual meeting, but it just blew me away. Uh, shunning's not going to go away, uh, but they're making, they're, they're, they're going to make, uh, keep making these cartoons, program the young people and make the young people run the organization and encourage the young people to be anointed. Uh, I think there's going to be a big change on this 144,000 being literal. I think it'll go symbolic. We'll see what happens. But anyways, folks, that's all I have for you today. And like I say, keep living your day with love. And don't worry about this annual meeting. It's just their annual meeting. But we covered it. And thanks to Miss Usado. She did a great job at writing that article. And you can find it again on Avoid JW. I'll pin it in the comments. We'll see you in the next video. Bye for now.